Free speech, how to define it and how to preserve it in America today. I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. On this video series, Speaking Freely, we're talking from time to time with thought leaders and major players in the free speech drama unfolding in America. Today, Anita Levy from the American Association of University Professors joins us in the studio. Anita Levy from the American Association of University Professors. Now that there's a there's an organization's title that tells you whom you represent. Absolutely. The faculty. The faculty, yes. And I want to talk with you about a faculty perspective on the free speech crisis on American campuses especially. Of course we know there's a crisis in civil society as well yeah. in state legislatures there are some quite alarming things happening. But what about campuses? How would you, from a faculty standpoint, describe the crisis on campus? I would have to say it's fairly acute at the moment. Um, faculty members have become, in many instances, targets for harassment. Um, either through uh, surreptitious filming uh, of their classes on campus and, and then releases to uh, the online through groups like Campus Reform, Professors Watch List, uh, other groups that um, take advantage of um, their access to the classroom. And we've also seen um, many instances where faculty members, through their posts on Facebook, on Twitter, um, have also become targets of harassment. Faculty, uh, from what I hear, talking with faculty members who consult with us, come looking for assistance to uh, the Department of Academic Freedom, Tenure, and Governance, which is where I um, work at the AUP, uh, are very concerned about what they can and cannot say in the classroom. They worry that uh, a misstep, a, a, you know, a word or a topic that uh, might uh, explode in, in their faces without, uh, you know, knowing, uh, without warning, essentially. Um, so what's happening is that faculty are, uh, some of them, I believe, are, are self-censoring. They are not sure what they can say in the classroom. And in many cases, these are instances where this is in their routine teaching. So in other words, the well-known controversy, of course, is around climate science. Right. Um, but we have other areas as well where faculty members in the course of their teaching um, have run into this kind of uh, harassment. And so they are really unsure of how to proceed and how to handle it. And what form does the harassment take? Uh, I, I, this filming of classes is quite alarming, I'm sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is an old problem. Unfortunately, right. since we've had smartphones, um, right. th this has been uh, happening in classrooms. So we have instances of, as I said, surreptitious um, uh, filming of uh, lectures that are then put online. Um, we have instances where um, a faculty member who teaches in an area that may um, draw attention, such as gender studies, ethnic mm -hmm. studies, uh, Latino studies, um, Jewish studies, these faculty members have been um, harassed via posters being put up on campus, 
targeting them, in some cases targeting family members um, mm. for uh, approbation. Um, they have, uh, they receive hate mail. Um, in some cases they have um, had to solicit their, their campus security to, you know, come to their classes to make sure that um, there are no disturbances in the classroom. So it takes a variety of forms. Um, and in some cases, it's, there have been actions by administrations, although we do find that administrations largely have been supportive of faculty members. And in these instances of harassment, it's coming from outside, the, from groups outside the campus. Are there not some cases where faculty members are um, opposing speakers who are invited to campus or in some cases invite themselves to campus and are participating in the silence of in the sil effort to silence speakers mm -hmm. um, the mostly the the instances we've heard about have been students um, more students more student activism in that regard um, what faculty members have been um, experiencing challenges to their academic freedom, as I said, through the classroom, right. through, in some cases, through their research. Of course, there's the famous um, instance of Michael Mann, who was the University of Virginia climate scientist, right. who did the famous hockey stick graph uh, about climate, uh, global warming, and he... Tell us that story. May, everyone may not have heard that. Well, um, he... Again, I, I may not have all the particulars, sure. um, but he was teaching, uh, doing research on climate science. And this was a, a number of years ago when he um, ch uh, published a graph that basically um, indicated the, the rate of, of global warming. And I guess because it had the shape of, uh, you know, a hockey stick looking like this, mm -hmm. that it, it got that name. And, um, and he was, was um, received a, a, a big challenge to uh, to it in, through the the state of Virginia. Uh, I believe there was some challenge with the attorney general. Um, he had uh, a, a lot of difficulties at the University of Virginia. Again, I'm I'm sorry. I'm not no, entirely. Okay. Um, familiar with the details. But his views were, he was accused of being biased or somehow. Oh, absolutely. Well, it was, he was accused of, um, um, you know, that, that global warming was, was not a real science, that... Right. Um, and that he was exaggerating the threat. Yes, yes. Right. Yes. What about this issue? There, there are a number of conservative groups uh, who complain that university and college faculty in the United States tend to be, now I'm a former college president, mm -hmm. so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to state what I've heard uh -huh. without giving any particular twist to it. Sure. But many people, and I think it's fair to say many people, a, a substantial number of people say the climate on college campuses, not as in climate change, but the political climate mm -hmm. is such that conservatives are not welcome. And you hear some students saying that they feel uncomfortable in their classes mm -hmm. if they express conservative views mm -hmm. these days. Well, you know, the, the AUP's position is that the campus and the classroom um, sh sh is is, should experience a, a freedom of, of ex exchange of ideas, right. um, that all students should be free to express their views. However, there is a difference between what goes on on campus and what goes on in the classroom. Yes. Um, on campus, of course, um, there should be an open exchange of ideas. And of course, in the classroom, there should be an open exchange of ideas. I, I don't think, I don't see anyone could be against that. Right. And, however, what the AUP uh, has long endorsed and developed in, in the notion of academic freedom is that academic freedom in the classroom um, is, a, is a guided exercise. In other words, 
the faculty member, um, by virtue of the fact that um, he or she has long trained, is specialized in their discipline, um, is well aware of the current research, um, the faculty member should have the um, academic freedom to shape and um, um, create a, a classroom uh, instructional environment and a syllabus that is guided by that special knowledge, that expertise. So in other words, everything doesn't go in the classroom. In other words, faculty speech and uh, student speech is mediated by this exchange of the faculty uh, expert, in a sense, and students who are there as learners. And the whole idea of the classroom is that the faculty member is there to help um, teach the students, give them the opportunity to develop their ideas, but within the guided framework of their expertise right. in a particular subject. But one hopes that these guides, these teachers, mm -hmm. would not be trying to eliminate other points of view I oh, mean, absolutely. From, from absolutely. the discussion. That yeah. there would be readings assigned that cover a variety absolutely. of points of view. That there would be uh, well, opportunities you know, well, to... Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Because when you say readings assigned that um, cover different points of view, we would not, for example, um, countenance a biology professor no. assigning readings on creationism. I understand. So, you know, there right. is... There is there's a, science and there's pseudoscience. Well, there's science and there's pseudoscience, but, but what, we, what we understand is that the faculty member uh, has the academic freedom to uh, as, as shape the syllabus in such a way that is in conjunction with the accepted knowledge within the field. And if the faculty member wants to teach creation science? Well, then we would potentially, and it would not be the AUP's judgment call, it would be uh, you know, potentially the, the call of the, uh, the faculty themselves on the campus. Right. But um, that could potentially be understood as, in a sense, professional malfeasance. Because the accepted uh, right. you know, judgment and, and factual knowledge right. in the field is that so, so sort of creationism is discredited. Sort of the equivalent of fake news, <laughs> of, of truly fake news. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it is incontestably true that college and university environments tend to be on the liberal side overall in this country. There are obviously some exceptions in some fields, et cetera. And, and uh, again, I've grappled with these issues in a day-to-day -day way. And I remember people saying, well, you should hire conservative faculty. And I remember saying, well, how? Tell me how. What, what is this mm -hmm. process? What's the questionnaire I distribute mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to elicit mm -hmm. views and decide who's a conservative right. faculty right. member? And how do, I, how do I make sure that that person won't change her or his mind over time about, mm -hmm. about some issues. But accepting that that's an unreasonable way of approaching the mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. and it's not easy to satisfy, is there a problem? Is there an, a, a, a lack of welcome for dissenting views in some departments on some campuses? I think it's a made up problem, frankly. Really? I do, because what we find in most universities is that it really depends on what school you're in, uh, what, right. what department. So in other words, you go to the engineering schools, you go to the sciences, you go to the business schools, you're, gonna, you're not going to hear that same argument. So oftentimes I think there's a, there's a focus, a microscopic focus on uh, the social sciences and the humanities, and the humanities right. that then is blown up to stand in for the entire university. Um, frankly, I think most universities are welcoming places. They are the, the so-called marketplace of ideas where students are exposed to a range of views in different classrooms across the spectrum. Um, the, the criteria should always be the expertise and the abilities of the faculty members. 
we would never, ever expect that there would be a political litmus test. No, well, they're, they're, Obviously. they're impossible. Exactly, exactly. Right. But, but more than that, I mean, faculty members train for years and years and years in their disciplines. Um, they do the research, they do the work, they are extremely serious about what they do. Now, sure, are there departments where, you know, I, I like to say, uh, that the, you know sometimes the smaller the teapot, the bigger the tempest, right? So you, <laughs> you get these departments that, you know, you'll get the warring factions between various, um, you know, right. f groups within the field. Sure. But it's not going to be Democrats and Republicans. No, and and, and by the way, it's not as if there are no such disputes within other fields and right. Out, right. outside the university. Sure. sure. I mean, corporations are. In many cases, there are great struggles that go on. It's right. just that we don't have the window into those struggles that we have with colleges and right. universities. Right, right, right. So when those struggles occur, do you think there are times when they are unfairly settled and that this has an impact on the education that students may get? Could you elaborate on what you mean by that? Well, I'm just trying to think. I mean, one of the examples that comes to mind uh, is some of the discussions of the Middle East that take place on college and university campuses. Mm -hmm. And pressure is put on to squelch certain views or to, and, and mm -hmm. especially in crisis moments. Mm -hmm. These aren't easy things to talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but. There are cases, uh, Professor Salaita. Salaita, yeah. Salaita. Mm -hmm. And he at, was my case at the, the AUP. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about that case then for sure. a minute. There's one that sure. you're an expert on. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think we have to be clear from the AAUP's perspective, the issue at stake with uh, Professor Salaita was the fact that he had been appointed as a faculty member and under let's, a, let's tell a little more about him okay okay and what what was offensive to some people about his point of view well um, professor Salida was was hired to teach uh, at the University of, of uh, Illinois Urbana-Champaign and he uh, teaches uh, in, in Middle Eastern studies and and uh, other related fields and he had been hired, uh, had received his appointment letter, had um, arranged to move his family um, to Urbana-Champaign and he, he, shortly before he was about to move, he had tweeted, there were some tweets about, at that time there was uh, the, uh, in Israel, Palestine, um, some flare-up. Flare-up, right, right. This was uh, several years ago. And he had tweet, tweeted, and some, there were some objections to his tweets, and um, the... They were pretty rough. They were, they were. Well, they were rough, but, they, but under AUP policy, we, right. uh, we understand that faculty members have three kinds of academic freedom academic freedom in the classroom, academic freedom of research, and academic freedom of so-called extramural utterances. Right. What they say as citizens, as um, uh, members of a community, um, including Twitter, Facebook, etc. Although we have had a lot of issues related to social media, and we sure. are working to develop a right. policy as it it's a different to, world. It is a different world. It is a different world. But in any case, we we uh, have long held that academic freedom of extramural utterance applies in such situations. So, regardless of the content of the tweets. Um, he had been given an academic appointment. He had a letter of appointment. Now, the, the glitch was, according to the university, is that it had not been approved yet by the Board of Trustees. However, under AAUP policy, uh, certain criteria held that we understood him as having been given the appointment right. so that he was serving on the faculty, and so we understood what they did as a dismissal. And because it was a dismissal, what we called for is that he should have had a hearing 
by his faculty peers mm -hmm. to determine whether or not um, in his professional capacity right. he should have been dismissed. And the university uh, <coughs> basically turned around and withdrew the appointment letter and um, they, they argued that he had not yet been appointed because the board had not um, put, you know, put its stamp of approval on. However, for many other faculty members, that board approval would come after they had begun the semester. Mm -hmm. So there was precedent that many faculty members were already on the faculty, had begun to teach, and, and it was a rubber stamp. And so jumping ahead, he, he won his case against did, the University of he Illinois. Did. He and did. And had a, a large financial settlement. He did. However, um, from what I understand, he's had um, difficulty um, getting other academic appointments since then. He was at uh, American University in Beirut most recently, right. as far as I know, and I don't know uh, at the moment. Um, so in some ways he was a marked man after this right, controversy right, right, uh, right, with, right. with the University of Illinois. Right. And uh, does that happen often? Um, yes and no. I mean, we don't have we don't keep data on sure. when faculty members uh, run into situations like these. Do they get other jobs? Um, what what happens to them? But it can be very difficult. And faculty members, some are very circumspect about how they speak out. They're very cautious, sure. um, especially until and if they get tenure. Um, others feel as if principles are at stake and they, they have to speak out. But in, in a, it, it depends on how well publicized the event is, um, how much attention sure. it's gotten. So yeah, they can become marked and they can find it very difficult to right. find other positions in academia. It really depends. One other issue that has been discussed a lot recently about faculty rights and, and faculty concerns has to do with Title IX enforcement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think many of the people viewing this, most of the people viewing this will know that Title IX has to do with uh, gender rights. Uh, originally it was thought of to do mostly with athletics, but mm -hmm. increasingly right. Is, right. is seen as a, an avenue toward dealing with sexual harassment, mm -hmm. sexual mm -hmm. misconduct mm -hmm. on university campuses. Right. Right. And there is one strain of opinion, represented in part by Professor Kipnis from Northwestern, Laura mm -hmm. Kipnis, mm -hmm. that this has been overdone, mm -hmm. that, that it has produced a climate of fear and intimidation among faculty right. in particular mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. university campuses. How, how does the AAUP feel, if, if there's a, an institutional view, or what is your view of how that's panning right, out right, right. Now. Well, actually we do, and we, we, our Committee on Women in the Academic Profession produced a lengthy report right. uh, a couple of years ago on Title IX, uh, the history, uses, and abuses of Title IX. And we, too, um, have taken some issue with the way Title IX enforcement was being carried out mm -hmm. on college campuses. Now, I should say that this is all in a sense suspended at the moment because of the current administration's approach and uh, it's different <laughs> well it's different and also it's changing because right. uh, the current secretary of education uh, is reviewing the matter and um, so we don't know exactly how it's going to shake out but when uh, several years ago when it, it the um, Title IX investigations uh, took off with, with um, great force. What we saw in some cases was that um, faculty members, and especially the concern that, that we had was faculty speech in the classroom uh, related to their discipline, that um, complaints related to uh, faculty speech in the classroom were not being adjudicated in the way that that we uh, would call for, which is again by a faculty body in a hearing uh, on the record, 
uh, you know, with the ability to call witnesses and, uh, you know, a full and open uh, hearing of the matter. Um, what ha the, the, the several problems with Title IX, the way it has been adjudicated, is that the, the, the standard of evidence had changed. Um, to what they call a preponderance of evidence, which is basically like 51 percent, um, right. more the case than not. And you know, this this is it's a it's a dicey proposition because of course we know that sexual harassment and sexual assault occurs on campuses, and it is a it can be a huge problem for serious students, problem. a very serious problem. Um, the, the, the piece of that, as I said, that we address was primarily what happens in the classroom, but also as, it, as they relate to faculty right. interactions. We know as well that there have been cases where faculty members have taken advantage, have harassed students, um, that the, the, the power dynamic between faculty right. members and students can be particularly difficult and as we're seeing now in many many areas in in our culture um, that dynamic um, is toxic in some instances especially when it comes to men in power and so we we know that there's a problem however what we were looking for and what we still advocate is what we call the clear and convincing standard of evidence um, clear and convincing clear and conv standard of evidence. Yes, right. yes, which is the standard. I wanted to repeat that because it's different from a preponderance of. Yes, clear and convincing is. You know, I, I'm not a lawyer. No, I just, I, but you know, sometimes I just play one. You know, on, on television, <laughs> or I feel right. like it. But um, that would be more like what. 75 percent, 80 percent, you know, the, the evidence that, that something occurred. Um, and also, again, that the hearing is particularly important. Um, what we see with Title IX on campuses now is that the, um, when the Obama administration and the Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights began to enforce Title IX in a new way, which was welcomed by many student activists on, uh, whose, whose claims of sexual assault sure. had not been taken seriously. There was a problem. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, right. and there still is a problem. Right. But what we've seen is this new industry of Title IX right. administrators has grown up on campuses, and so you get these Title IX officers, many of whom, you know, we don't know how they've been trained. They are not necessarily familiar with um, faculty work or uh, academic freedom issues. And so there's sometimes a, uh, an unfortunate mix that occurs when these cases uh, are adjudicated when faculty members are concerned. Right. So we've, we uh, addressed uh, many of those issues in our report. We included recommendations for faculty members, for, for administrators, um, Etc. On, on ways to um, attempt to improve this situation. We're having this conversation late in 2017, mm -hmm. and there has recently been an explosion of revelations about public figures, oh, yeah. mentors in many fields, mm -hmm. uh, people in the media, very prominent people in the media, mm -hmm. uh, all and that certainly crosses ideological lines. Uh, yes, no, absolutely. No question about That's it. That's right. And uh, one wonders, you know, when, where this will go, mm -hmm. what its long-term impact will be, and when it will, when it will sort of settle down to a calmer time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I imagine, on college and university campuses, this is a matter of considerable stress at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, you know, it's stressful for many women in, in of it all is. Wa walks of life. Right. Um, and of course students, uh, especially young women, but, but young men as well, are, are just getting on their feet. They, sure. they may come to college, uh, you know, fascinated by the academic world. I mean, I know that when I was a student and my professors were 
you know, the ones that, that were really excellent, I just looked up to them and I thought the world of them and it's a very And that was a wonderful time. thing. It was a wonderful thing, but you of course don't want to, to ruin that, no. right? And you don't want to abuse that power and I think it's an issue potentially for both male and female professors. Oh, I think we, so. You know, we've seen it more with, with male academics than with, with female. Um, you know, I'm sure that students um, welcome this development. Um, there, you know, this wonderful explosion of, and in this case, I think we have to thank social media mm -hmm. for this. That makes it right. easier. And there's and, a sense of empowerment. Too. Well, absolutely. Now, you know, it can't just stop there, of course. Yeah. And, and you know, I I need a crystal ball to you know sure. say where it's going to go, but it will be really interesting to find out. And I think there are many of us, in my generation at least, who frankly, when this first started happening, thought, didn't we do this already? <laughs> you know, isn't this done? And obviously it was far from done. Right. I mean, it was begun. But some of, the, some of the incidents are from quite a long time ago. And I think that um, memory sometimes plays tricks. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to question the sincerity mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. men or women, especially people who were young women or men at the right. time, right. Of, of, about what they experienced. But there is this, there are many questions lurking as this discussion goes on about standards, double standards, uh, mm -hmm. judging history. Right with right. today's right and these are difficult right. you know these are very difficult issues to parse and issues about false accusation that's right and i think that you know at least on the college campus and and really in all you know in all areas um, you know i can't speak for obviously for the corporate world or the entertainment industry um, in some cases, there seems to be the overwhelming number of, of women who've stepped forward uh, that it makes it indisputable. Right. Um, and right. then there, you know, there are well, other kinds of, of pretty, evidence. Right. And right. the standard you used before, the sort of clear and clear and convincing, and convincing. And, right. When it, sometimes the numbers are clear and absolutely. Convincing. But in cases, you know, that might occur on the college campus. Um, again, I think there has to be a fair process. Right. Um, sure, there's a danger that, um, you know, of misremembering, of changing a definition, of, of seeing something in an indifferent light now than, than, than then. But, you know, we know that this is a problem. Of course. And I think the, the impulse has been in the past not to believe the women. And right. if we go overboard for a little while towards believing too much, perhaps, we will hopefully eventually come back to a middle ground where we put into place and that may processes. Be what the that may be what the Trump administration says it's doing in this area, <laughs> is correcting for having gone overboard. Well, you know, we, we, uh, the AUP actually finds itself in an interesting position vis-a-vis -vis the Title IX uh, issue, to go back to that for a minute, because, uh, you know, sometimes strange bedfellows are made, and in this yes. case, the, the administration is calling for a return to the stronger standard of, of evidence, uh, right. as much as the AUP does, and as much as this makes so us there uncomfortable, you are. exactly. <laughs> there you find yourself. <laughs> and it will be very interesting to see what the result of all of this is on free speech. On, oh, absolutely. On the, on the capacity of people to speak candidly, open, right. openly, right. and contemporaneously right. about what is happening, right. without being intimidated, without, right. without having to be silenced. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, of course, is one of the concerns of our project. Right. So there are a lot of strange bedfellows here. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. You're Anita. welcome. Thank you. We've been discussing free speech issues on college and university campuses with Anita Levy from the American Association of University Professors. To learn more about Georgetown University's free speech project, please visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.